Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. If you want, if you watch the course live or in the recording, today we will talk about algebraic functions, algebraic solutions of differential equations, and the reduction model of P. So we started already last time <coughs> with <coughs> differential equations in positive characteristic. Today we will move first towards the algebraicity of solutions in characteristic zero, or actually over an arbitrary field. And then we will move on to the characterization of algebraic solutions through the reduction model of P of the differential equation. So some of you may have already heard part of what we are doing today, because there's a slight overlap with the class I have given two years ago. But in any case, it's, I think it's nice mathematics, and so I hope you will enjoy. So let me call this uh, algebraic solutions, of course, of differential equations, and the reduction modulo p, any prime p. And uh, first I want to talk a little bit about algebraic solutions. And uh, let us look at an example. So we start with something which is clearly algebraic. So I think I want to take x to the power. <coughs> let me just check. 1 half plus x to the power 1. So this is square root of x plus x. So this is not a power series at 0, but we don't care. So this would be a Puiseux series. Puiseux series, which means that we also allow rational exponents. But this is not a big deal. We can treat them simultaneously. So then, <coughs> if we take the derivative, y prime of x is 1 half x to the minus 1 half plus 1, and y double prime of x will be <coughs> minus 1 quarter x minus 3 half. OK? So here we see already that we will get a differential equation of order 2 y of x satisfies second order differential equation. And we now, in this context, we will always uh, only allow differential equations with polynomial coefficients. So it looks as follows, 2x square y double prime minus x y prime plus y equals 0. So this is an Euler equation, as you now already know, Euler. Okay, And uh, we can look for a basis of solutions with basis of solutions. Precisely the two summons here, y1 of x equals x to the 1 half, and y2 of x equals x. So the, <coughs> the local exponents, as you easily check, rho equals 1 half, sigma equals 1. Now, there is a small delicacy here. So the minimal polynomial of our y of x, minimal polynomial, p x y of our original y of x is, now this is not too hard to compute, p x y equals, well, where do we have it, y square minus 2 x y plus x square minus x. So this would be, yeah, in C, x, y. And always we consider this as a polynomial in y with coefficients 
rational functions in the field, function field of x. Okay? So now there is a small delicacy here. Note if we now look at the differential equation, there is no hope to recover this minimal polynomial. It seems impossible. to deduce p from l. So l would be here the differential operator, second order differential operator. Why is this impossible, or at least not obvious, is the following. Here, when you look, sorry, when you look at the differential equation, you will have a vector space of solutions. No? All linear combinations of these. And each linear combination will have a different minimal polynomial. Okay? Of course, x of 1 half and x itself will be easy, but the other ones will have varying minimal, minimal polynomials. And it is not clear how to detect from this one just this linear combination of the basis yeah, and to recover the minimal polynomial. Yeah? So that's one of the problems when you try to go from a differential equation to algebraic solutions. You don't know what to look for, OK? So, <clears throat> so it is not clear how to describe from the differential equation The algebraicity of the solutions by minimal polynomials. Now, one way out could be to look at the Galois group, but uh, even if you try to find the Galois group of the according field extension, it is not clear at all how to recover or construct this Galois group from L. So this is a first warm-up example. And uh, now I want to show you that whenever you have an algebraic function like this, it also satisfies a differential equation. So let me call this proposition. And this is a very old proposition. It, it appears already in the work of Abel from 1827, and then somebody called Cockle. So this was 1860, and Harley from 1862. But I guess it has been re-proven many, many times. OK. So I will restrict just to algebraic power series. So, and I do it over the complex numbers to simplify. Let, how do I want to call it? y of x in Cx be an algebraic power series then it is definite it is definite which is the same as holonomic and this means there exists l differential operator with polynomial coefficients such that L of Y of X is zero. Okay. So one can say a little bit more. Actually, whenever you have an algebraic series, it will have the conjugate series. Moreover, 
and the conjugates of y of x, which might be algebraic power series, but they could just be Fusier series. The conjugates of y of x also satisfy Ly equals 0. And actually, this is already a basis of solutions and already form a C basis of solutions. So in particular, in particular, the, dam the order of L, in particular, it may be a little bit exaggerated, but the order of L is a dimension over C of the conjugates, the space zeros of the minimal polynomials of conjugates of y of x. Counting y of x itself as a conjugate, uh, maybe I put this quotation marks. So in particular, this differential equation here, ly equals 0, will have only algebraic solutions. Yeah? And they are precisely the conjugates of y of x. It could, a priori, it could be that there are more, but they are not. Okay. So that's a, a <clears throat> very prominent proposition. It is not too hard to prove, but both proofs which I will give are not very satisfactory. They are not very satisfactory because they don't give us a formula for this L here in terms of the minimal polynomial Pxy of y. We just get a, the existence. Yeah? So we have to live with it, the proof. And I will give you two proofs. So in the notes, you will find more details. I will just give you the main ideas. So the obvious thing is you take the minimal polynomial and you differentiate it with respect to x. Differentiate p x y of x with respect to x. So this equals 0. So what do you get? You get dx p x y of x plus y prime of x dy p x y of x is 0. Whenever I write y of x, I mean the given series. And when I write y, I mean the variable. Okay. Now, <clears throat> p is the minimal polynomial. So this here is the p minimal polynomial. In particular, it is irreducible. And dy p x y of x will be non-zero. Yeah, even more, uh, this is one condition. The other condition is, hence, how do I want to write it? Yes. We can choose a, b. So now I write always rational functions as coefficients this. And when I write just p, I don't substitute the function for y. So ap plus b dyp equals uh, equal 1. Sorry, this was too fast. Equal 1. Where do I have my equal to 1? OK. So if I now substitute in this equation, which is a, a polynomial equation in y, if I substitute y by y of x, we get, so I think this is very elegant, 
So if we substitute here, this will vanish. So we are just left with b x y of x times dy p x y of x equals 1. So this means that 1 over dy p of x y of x, so the inverse, the multiplicative inverse of this one here, is actually a polynomial in x and y of x. I, maybe I can still write it here, dy p x y of x is in c. I always write this. And here we add now y of x. OK? OK, now we can combine everything. And we can divide here in this equation by dy p x of y of x. And then we get together, we get y prime of x equals minus, what do we have? dx p x y of x over dy p of x y of x. And this will now lie, this is uh, just from this equation, but this will be now a polynomial with coefficient in Cx of y of x. So <clears throat> the derivative of our algebraic function is a polynomial in y of x with coefficients rational functions in x. Okay. So we can repeat. repeat and get that all derivatives lie in Cx y of x. But this guy here, as yx is algebraic over Cx, this is a finite dimensional vector space over Cx. This is finite dimensional vector space over Cx. But we have infinitely many derivatives. Hence, the series Ykx must be Cx linearly linearly dependent, say, satisfy a differential equation L y equals 0, L in Cx, a joint del. So this gives us just the existence. Remark just proves the existence of L without any further information. OK? Everybody happy so far? Proof number two. So this is uh, two, and here I will just give you a sketch. So the other one is a kind of construction of the operator L, but it requires to know all conjugates of y. Let y1 of x up to yn of x be the roots of pxy in some splitting field s of cx, splitting field of the minimal polynomial. Okay. Now, 
I will just write y1 up to yn for these roots to spare space. And then you look at the Vronskian as follows. So you take <coughs> capital W. Now I don't know how to do with my space. So we take W1, y1, W of y1, yn, which is y1, y1 prime, y1 n minus 1 up to yn, yn prime. I hope you can read this, yn n minus 1. This is one thing we take. And then we ta also take the same. Maybe I can write it here. Oh, I'm running out of space. I want to add now, so this is an n by n matrix. And now we will also consider an n plus 1 times n plus 1 matrix, where we add one column corresponding of a variable and its formal derivatives. So these are just symbols for the moment. The derivative of a variable is not defined. But we can use it as a symbol to construct from this our differential operator. So <clears throat> we also consider y1, yn, and y. This is now a variable, which will be the variable of our differential equation afterwards. So we take y1 up to y. I'm a little bit confused. Hold on. Now we go to yn, sorry. Yes. So we take, yeah, that's now an n plus 1 matrix. yn y1, yn n. And then we have here y, y prime up to y n. n plus 1 times n plus 1 matrix. And the trick is now to take the determinants of both and to divide them. Then look at, of course, this requires the knowledge of these conjugate solutions of the minimal polynomial. Then look at, we take the determinant of the big matrix W, Y1, Yn, Y, and the determinant of W of, sorry, W, Y1 up to Yn. Now this is, now if you plug it in, you get a Laurent series in x, the coefficient, and this will appear to be a polynomial in y. So it will be even linear in, yeah, I write it like this, but y prime up to yn. And here I add linear in y, y prime up to yn. So actually, this is nothing else than L y, where L is a linear differential operator. But L has coefficients for the moment in Cx. Actually, I should take Puget series, but you apologize then. Okay. So now you do a little bit of Galois theory. So you take the, the Galois group of the extension consider the Galois group G of rational functions in X and uh, the splitting field of S, but we adjoin, we adjoin 
these unknowns y, y prime up to y n. Okay, this is just a formal adjunction. Here we have all the y1 up to y n inside. And proof, that's not very hard to prove, that the action of the Galois group will fix this L. And show that G stabilizes, fixes L. Hence the coefficients that so it fixes L because you have divided here by the determinant of the brown skin of y1 up to yn. Hence the coefficients lie in the fixed field of the Galois group of G, which is Cx. And you are done. So L, hence, L will indeed lie will have polynomial or rational functions coefficients. Again, this is not very explicit because you have no hold remark as before, no apparent control. over the exponents of L. So maybe you can find a third proof. So this is a challenge, which is maybe very, very hard. Try to find a third proof. giving some information about L. So in what sense? So that's a kind of philosophical problem. You start with an algebraic function. You know that it satisfies a differential equation, and this differential equation will even have minimal order, as one can show. But you don't get all differential operators with rational coefficients or with polynomial coefficients. You only get a certain subclass of differential operators. And the big, the big question is, how does this subclass of operators, which come from an algebraic equation, from an algebraic function, how do these look like? Okay. So one approach to do this was to try to characterize these operators by reduction modulo p. This was Grotendieck's proposal to see from the reduction of L mod p and the solutions of the induced equation whether L came from an algebraic function as it did here. Okay. So this was my first proposition of today. Are there any questions from your side or comments? We are today, we are a small group, so we could even have a chat if you want, or you could also, if you wish, you can turn on your camera however you like. I think I can erase this. So that's, that's a typical type of, of proofs in this, in this context. Now I erase everything. And we go on to the second proposition I want to prove today. So there are three pieces today. This was the first piece showing that every algebraic function satisfies a differential equation with polynomial coefficients. Now I will prove a second, condition, second property of algebraic functions, which is Eisenstein's theorem. So, bum, bum, bum. I think I use this one. So, Eisenstein theorem. Now we take algebraic functions with 
the rational coefficients that y of x in q of x be an algebraic series with rational coefficients then y of x is almost integral. Which means another terminology is, is globally bounded this notion comes from the periodic valuations but what I mean is simply that <clears throat> up to multiplica multiplication of x with a natural number, let me take maybe lambda of x is now a power series with integral coefficients lambda in n non-zero uh, suitably. So in particular, the coefficients of, of y of x in particular. And that's kind of surprising. The denominators of the coefficients of y of x involve only finitely many primes, namely the prime factors of lambda, namely the prime factors of lambda. So Eisenstein just gives an example. He takes the eighth root of 1 plus x to the b. So <clears throat> this you can write it as 1 plus x b over a, a b integers. Okay. And he claims that actually this a will be our lambda. Okay. So you can here, you can do binomial expansion and you get sum k from 0 to infinity <coughs> b a over k x to the k. This is defined. This is just the binomial coefficient. The upper number can be rational. So you have to show something for these binomial coefficients. But Maybe I write it down. This is b over a k is of the form b over a times b over a minus 1 down to b over a minus k plus 1. And below we have k factorial. And the claim is that this lies in 1 over lambda k z if lambda is suitable. Okay, actually you could take for lambda, you could take a. Now this is not so clear because here you will have k factorial with many different primes. So you have to show an infinite number of cancellations. As k increases, yeah, all these factors have to can to cancel. So I have to prove that many cancellations of prime factors of k factorial occur. So I did not 
dispose of a proof. I just read this theorem, but <clears throat> in, the, in the few references I had, there was no proof or maybe a very complicated one. So I gave it to a combinatorialist in Vienna. And he could, at least for this here, he could prove that this has this property using Legendre symbols and one page of computations. So <clears throat> this was not very satisfying because if you now take, for instance, the sum of two such functions, then you get completely stuck because you can no longer uh, check these properties. Okay? Or if you take an iterated root of a root. OK, so you can also already try for the square root of 1 plus x and try to prove it on your own. So I give you, again, two proofs. Actually, a proof which is one proof but consists of two parts. First, we do an easy case, and then we do a more difficult case. So. <clears throat> So easy is maybe not a good word in mathematics, but uh, assume in addition that y of 0 is 0. This is just for simplicity. I don't care about it. So we have no constant term. and that y of x is a tal algebraic. So this is a little bit stronger than being algebraic, and it means the following. If p x y in q x y is the minimal polynomial, of y of x, assume that if you take dy of p, <clears throat> now everything is local at 0, is non-zero. So this is the assumption of the implicit function theorem. So in this case, the proof is rather uh, direct, and I will show you how it goes. So <clears throat> with this assumption, so what does this mean here? That in terms of p, p will have a linear term which involves a y. So with this assumption, p of x, y will be c times y plus further terms. So possibly linear in x and higher order terms. Yeah. Maybe dx plus higher order. And the c is non-zero. c is a rational number. So actually, we can assume that c is integer because we can multiply yeah, without loss of generality. c is in z. Okay. Now we do a trick. So the trick is the following, is to arrange our situation so that this lambda comes into the game. We replace x by c of x. I'm not happy yet. No. Now, replace. So c is now an integer, so we are allowed to replace this. We could take that it is even positive. Now replace x by c of x, 
And I think I also want to replace I think x e square of x and y by c y. What happens if we replace here y by c y? We get a, a new p. We get a new p of the form. So this is a very useful trick here. You get, I write again, maybe, maybe I should write p tilde xy. So this will be now c square y plus. From this dx, we get d c square x. And then from the higher order terms, which are at least quadratic, we will get c square times something. You agree? Simple computation. So of course, the replacement of x by c square x does not change the statement here. And of course, we can also multiply our unknown function with a constant, everything integer. But now, in this p tilde, we are allowed to divide by c square. Divide by c square and get, and now we get a monic minimal polynomial. One over c square p tilde x y y plus d x plus <coughs> something of c y c square x, which is now a y tilde of x. So this already involves such a change here. And of course, multiplying y with the integer does not change the statement. So as we have now here a pure y, we can apply Newton algorithm. All this here will be integers. Here we have now integer coefficients because our p from the very beginning we could assume that it is in z. Huh? Maybe I should have written here z. No? So now the Newton algorithm which recall is a substitution algorithm. Substitution algorithm where you divide by the partial derivative with respect to y, but here the partial derivative is 1, so you have no division, shows no divisions. Yeah, coefficient of y is equal to 1. And as you substitute here, the terms which come after the y, you get integer coefficients. Shows no division, and hence produces a series y tilde x with integer coefficients. So there are two ingredients in this proof. First, to take this assumption and to see that this assumption allows you to apply this trick here of substituting x by c square x and y by c y, and then you have y. Okay. So I like this kind of proof because it's a, a little bit tricky <coughs> and very efficient. So. I would be happy if you give me references for other proofs of Eisenstein's theorem. <clears throat> Actually, it's a little bit too much to call it a theorem. 
because this is completely elementary and not very difficult once you have seen it. Now, part B, the general case, where you don't have this assumption of on the partial derivative with respect to y, you reduce to this case. Reduce to the case A by cutting y of x at sufficiently into two pieces, into two pieces, I will explain in a moment, at sufficiently high degree. Again, this is a technique which appears very often in commutative algebra. So we will write y of x, which is a power series. Now I have to be a little bit careful. Where do I have it? I think I have it here. Yes. k of x plus x to the e, a of x, where k of x is a polynomial of a degree less than or equal to e, a of x is a series with a of 0 equals 0, so no constant term, such that xe, a of x, is just the truncation of y of x at degree k plus 1, e plus 1, sorry. So there is a certain re reason why I want to do, to put it here, having order 1 at least here. The reason is that I can then apply this technique. Now, the algebraicity of y is equivalent to the algebraicity of A. So y of x algebraic is equivalent to A of x algebraic. So sometimes this A of x is called the germ of the power series at infinity. So if we prove that A of x is almost integral, then we are done. So sufficient to prove that A of x is almost integral. OK? <clears throat> now, I claim that A of x, for a suitable choice of E, will fall into the case of part A. So choose E as follows. We take our minimal polynomial P. We derive this with respect to y x, y of x. Now, as p is a minimal polynomial, this is non-zero, so not identically zero. So it is an element, a power series in x. OK? So as it is non-zero, it has a well-defined order. Set e equals the order as a power series, so the lowest appearing degree of dy, p, x, y of x. OK. Now, what is the time? Oh, yeah. So I'm not going to prove this now, but that's a very nice exercise. Actually, it's a small challenge. 
So you can try to do it, but otherwise I can do it also next time. Or if you want, I put it in the exercises. Then substituting substituting. Where do we have this decomposition? Let me call this star in p x y of x equals 0. And applying twice Taylor expansion, produces a polynomial equation let me call it q now in x and a of x with dy of q at 0 0 non zero so A is a tal algebraic. Hence, A of x is a tal algebraic. And A part A applies. I hope you can still read it here. Yes. OK. So this was part three of our class today, uh, past two, sorry. Now we make a short break, and uh, then we will move on to reduction modulo P using these two results. OK, I hope you are ready again. So let's go now <clears throat> towards characteristic P. We will have first an observation which is without characteristic P. And then I will at least formulate a theorem which involves characteristic P. OK. So I want to recapitulate what we have learned so far today. What did we learn up to now, today? Two things. <clears throat> if y of x, now I start directly in power series defined over the rational, is algebraic, then all its conjugates satisfy a linear differential equation L y equals 0 over qx. Hence, not hence, but form and form a pieces of solutions. Forming a Q basis of solutions. OK. And as we have only finitely many, they are almost integral in the sense that up to multiplying x with a natural number, <coughs> which are all almost integral, which means up to multiplication of x with a 
integers. They become integrals. Okay. So now we can go back. We could ask the following, and that's a conjecture of Bézivin. Bézivin conjecture, which is not very well known, which is a weaker version of the Grotendieck conjecture. Maybe it is even equivalent to the Grotendieck conjecture, but we don't know. <coughs> Let L be in Q x del be a differential operator, differential operator with polynomial coefficients defined over Q. So this Bézivin conjecture, which is from, I think, 1981, something like this, so 1986. So let L be a differential with polynomial coefficient defined over Q. And now we go back having a Q basis of almost integral solutions so let l be a defined over q having a q basis of almost integral solution then these solutions are already algebraic over Qx. So that's a very beautiful conjecture. So <clears throat> I should mention Ali in Boston here, because together with Ali, we formulated this conjecture, and then Ali found out that this conjecture already exists in the literature and was formulated by Bézivin. There are similar conjectures due to Mazat, Christol, and other people, but this one is maybe the, one of the most beautiful ones because it is so compact, elementary, and <laughs> completely out of reach. So <clears throat> note the Grotendieck conjecture So the validity of the Grotendieck conjecture implies the Bezivan conjecture. And for the, this one is not clear. We have no counterexample. Okay. So that's a, an <coughs> intriguing question. We would certainly love to to solve, but uh, it's not clear how to, to get this algebraicity. Yeah? As I told you, uh, we have no way of controlling the minimal polynomial from the differential equation. Yeah? Yeah, so <clears throat> of course, I mean here, if I write solutions of Ly equals 0. So this is kind of a converse. This is a converse either to Eisenstein or to this other theorem. Yeah? So this is a converse to the preceding two results. So you would have found sufficient conditions for algebraicity. OK. So uh, what shall we do with this? I will give you the 
I will now formulate again the version of the Grotenik conjecture. And the first case to study is, seems to be very simple. First case to study is the case when the differential operator L has order of 1. Order of L equals 1. And so Ly is just y prime minus r of x y equals 0, and r a rational function in one variable. Rational function. So we thought of having a proof of this case for Bézivin, but apparently there was a gap which we could not fill yet. So this was very nice work of my student Sergei Jokovic. But unfortunately, it's not complete yet. Maybe we can fill it. So I want now to compare this with the Grotendieck conjecture in, in the case of order one equations. So let me formulate the, now as a theorem. And of course, from this, you would also get the busy y for order one, but one would like to have a direct proof. So this is a P curvature conjecture for order one equation. Formulated in a suitable way. Equivalent R, the following two condition, conditions. So I formulate it in a quite general setting. Every first order differential equation, Ly equals 0 with coefficients. in Qx, rational or polynomial coefficients without loss of children, which admits a lot of rights, which admit for almost all primes p in Z, a reduction Sorry, which admits for almost all primes p a non zero, it's a little bit lengthy, a non zero solutions, solution in fp x now, even rational, uh, modulo p. So we can look at Ly equals zero modulo p for almost all primes because here r will only involve finitely many primes. Okay. And the, this is the assumption. Whenever you have a first order differential equation, which model of p has a basis of rational solutions, or one non-zero rational solution, uh, has a non-zero algebraic solution. y of x <coughs> over q of x, so in characteristic 0. So I repeat, the assumption is that modulo p for almost all primes p, you find uh, rational solutions or even polynomial solutions. You can reduce to the case of polynomial solutions. Then you can lift this to an algebraic solution in characteristic 0. And the second condition is now something from number theory, which is a theorem of Kronecker. <clears throat> so every algebraic number, I don't know, I think I want to call it alpha in C, 
whose reduction modulo p, I'm a little bit vague here, but I will make it precise, <coughs> whose reductions modulo p are in fp for almost all primes, P, I will define what is the reaction modulo P of an algebraic number, all primes P, is already a rational number. And this is known to be true with the theorem of Kronecker. So several people proved several versions of this. And nowadays, one could it could be seen as a, as a special case of Chebotarev's Chebotarov's Chebotarev density theorem. So that's very striking that for this type of equations, number theoretic properties come into play. And I give you a different version of Kronecker's result, which is if a polynomial P, capital P, in Qx vectors linearly modulo P for almost all primes P, then it vectors over Q. It vectors linearly over Q. So all the roots of P will be algebraic numbers conjugate to each other. And if they, they lie in FP, then we get it even the roots in Q. So now. What is the time? We don't have too much time left. I'm not going to do the proof today. So maybe I either we stop here or I tell you a little bit more about the reduction modulo P. Maybe let me do five more minutes just to, to complete this, and then I will recall it next time and give you more details. So here we need a little bit about algebraic number fields. So reduction modulo P. So <clears throat> let alpha and C be an algebraic number. So algebraic over Q, <coughs> F in Qx is a minimal polynomial, monic irreducible F of alpha equals 0. And then we get, <coughs> we adjoin alpha to q, so this will be q x mod f. OK. Um, so this is the <coughs> number field. And inside, we have OK in k, the ring of integers. So that's the subring of elements of k integral over z. So integral meaning having a monic minimal polynomial. So <clears throat> if we start with alpha, it need not lie in the ring of integers. But note, k 
k-alpha in OK for a suitable k in N. Okay. Now, the, the, we can look at the prime ideal P of OK. Let P in OK be a prime ideal. One can classify these prime ideals in terms of the minimal polynomial of alpha. I'm not going to do it now. With intersection. So if we go down to z, z is, of course, inside the ring of integers. Then we get the prime ideal of z, and this is now p times z, p prime number. So I distinguish between prime ideals. This is a script p and prime numbers, which are a Roman p. OK. <clears throat> One says that this prime ideal lies over the prime number p. OK. Then OK mod p is a finite field extension of fp <coughs> of a certain degree, say, of degree d. And we can write OK as a, a direct sum over z. And OK is isomorphic to z gamma 1 direct sum at a gamma n. n can be larger than d. Free, a free z module. So now we can take residues <coughs> if the degree is 1, OK p is 1, so it equals fp, then alpha bar, which is the residue class inside here, will actually have a representative or let me call it m bar with m integer, 0, 1, up to p minus 1. This is something we will use later, so representative of alpha. And uh, Kronecker, mm -hmm. excuse me? Mm -hmm. Alpha bar is now, so I assume that alpha is in OK up to mm -hmm. multiplication, and then I take the residue inside OK mod P. OK? okay this is under the assumption that it's in. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. maybe write here alpha in OK. Sorry. Yes? And Kronecker, I will come back to this with more detail next time. Kronecker then reads as follows. If alpha bar is in FP, for almost all p, then alpha is already rational. It will also appear in the notes. Okay, So that's what you mean here by when we talk about uh, reduction modulo p, yeah, here in part number two, modulo Prime number p means modulo the prime ideal script p, which lies over p. OK? So this is a little bit involved. I will come back to this next time in any case, because I would like to do the proof. OK? So <clears throat> the, the point here is that we have a condition which is purely number theoretic, where this statement here and also the basic one conjecture is in terms of of algebraic power series. OK? Very good. Ah, it's even, it's already 20 past 6. So we stop here for today. So next week, we will have class as usual on Tuesday. And then maybe 
I will do an extra class, or at least I will record one more class, because at the beginning of January, I cannot give a class because I'm traveling. Uh, so I will communicate this to you by email. In any case, next week we meet again. I have a certain uh, <clears throat> backlog for the notes and the exercises because I was a bit busy the last days. So the new notes will combine what we did last time today and also next time, in particular the proof of this case here of the Grotendieck conjecture. And the exercises will appear soon also. And there will also be solutions to exercises, but this takes still a little bit to wait. OK, I think that's all for today. Thank you for listening. I hope you got a little bit the flavor of what's going on. And I'll be happy to meet you again next week. Bye bye, and have a wonderful day. Thanks, bye. Bye, thank you.